take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. I'm losing half my congregation right here. That's a good thing, though. It's a good sight. Matthew chapter 28, and then find verse 18. You may also want to find Acts chapter 1, and just put your bulletin there. We'll get there in a moment. Um, As promised, as I have been saying now for quite some time, as we were drawing closer to our move, uh, I asked the Lord for some guidance and leadership. I want to preach a, a series of sermons to hopefully prepare our hearts for what is to come. It seems like it's been a long road, and other times it feels like we just broke ground. Uh, But we are getting really, really close to leaving this uh, campus, moving to our new worship facility. If you haven't seen it in a while, man, it it is gorgeous in there. I saw a picture from the sound booth yesterday. All of the pews are laid out. They're going to finish bolting those down. The pew people will probably be gone uh, by tomorrow. In other words, it looks like a church. The pulpit is there. The choir chairs are there. And uh, the pews are there. I told Thomas, why don't we just go on down there? We got everything we need. But it's not quite ready. But um, while they finish getting the building ready, I pray that God would get our hearts ready, right? for what he wants to do in us and through us. What I want to do the next four weeks, and you know, we may be in there by the time this series is over, uh, but I want to preach on the four pillars of the church. The four pillars of the church. And uh, we're beginning today with pillar number one, and really, none of these are given in order of, of providence or, or prominence. It's all just about four things our church must be built on. If we are to do what God has saved us and called us to do. So today we're looking at pillar number one, the Great Commission. Let's stand together as we read these verses. You know them well. Um, Probably not going to tell you anything today you have not heard before. But sometimes God certainly uses his word to refresh our hearts and minds to kind of recalibrate us to what we're supposed to be doing. If you're there, say amen. Verse 18, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying... All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Let's just hit pause already. All right, so before we get to the commission, let's focus on the commander. This isn't a Baptist idea. This isn't a Jamie idea, which we'd all agree Jamie has great ideas. This isn't a Jamie thing. This isn't something me, Matt, and Colin developed in a staff meeting. This is the word of God. Say amen. All right. We're on the same page that the Bible is the uh, Holy Spirit inspired word of God. And if you have a Bible like mine, these aren't just words. These are the red parts. What does the red parts mean? It's literally what Jesus said. And he says, all authority has been given to me. In other words, listen, because you need to pay attention to what I'm about to say. And here's what he said. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, and aren't you thankful for this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. May God bless the reading of his word. You can be seated. It's been wild, hasn't it, watching the Weather Channel and watching what's going on in other parts of the, of the country with snow and ice and loss of power and all of these things. I don't know if you're like me. I like a little snow. I like for it to start about 10 o'clock in the morning and stop about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and then I like for it to be gone the next day. That's kind of how I like my snow, a very fluffy snow, very dry snow, just good enough to sled a few times and then be done. Uh, I've been thankful for where we're living. I can stand a little rain. Uh, We're not covered in ice and we do have heat and electricity and all those things. But in the midst of that, this headline jumped out to me this week. Pitchers and catchers report for spring training. How many baseball fans do we have? Do we have any baseball fans in here? So what that means is 
Uh, it's time for baseball to start. They're calling it spring training. A third of the country is under ice. And what's going to happen is these pitchers and catchers, it's nothing really exciting. They come together, these people that have played baseball their whole lives. And you know what the pitchers and catchers do? They throw that ball back and forth time and time again, just working on the basic fundamentals. Pitchers and catchers report, then the rest of the team reports. They'll go over bunning. They'll catch fly balls. They'll work on the infield with double plays and all of those other things that on TV looks like it just, it just comes natural. And the reason it comes natural is because they have drilled to the point that, it, that their bodies just, just take over. I heard Nick Saban say one time, we at Alabama, we don't practice till we get the play right. We practice till we can't get it wrong. That explains a lot of their success, doesn't it? What he's saying is, we not only have some of the best players, but we practice harder and we practice better and we drill the fundamentals. And I understand today that what I'm preaching is the fundamentals. And I know sometimes the fundamentals aren't very exciting, but I will tell you this. If we'll be faithful in the fundamentals, then we'll see God do extraordinary things through our church. And that's what we all want. Amen? So let's, let's dive in here. First of all, Note with me that we are called to go. We are called to go. Jesus says in verse 19, go, therefore. He, he didn't say, wait and see. And sometimes I think we as the church, we, we read this great commission, and it sounds very good, and we agree with it, but, but practically we're not really obeying what Christ has told us to do. Sometimes I get, I get the impression that we're kind of watching the stars and we're waiting on the signs of the times to tell us that Jesus is about to come. And if Jesus is coming tomorrow, then hey, let's get on this great commission today. Or if it looks like Jesus may be coming in six months, well, then we'll really ramp up our efforts. Now, here's the truth of the matter on the Word of God. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you when Jesus is going to come. And anybody that pretends to know the day and the hour Jesus is going to come, you need to ignore that person because Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. But here's my, here's my great, very deep theological truth I'm about to lay on you this morning. Are you ready? We are closer today than we were yesterday. And that may be him right there calling to say, that he's coming. I believe he is calling to tell you. But we are closer today than we were yesterday. And I do know this and I believe this with all of my heart. You may have seen your last sunrise today. Today may be your last sunset. We don't know when Jesus is going to come. We don't know how many days we're going to be alive. So what Jesus is saying, if you have a day today, then go. Don't wait and see. Some churches take this to mean that we, we just need to welcome people when they come to our church. And certainly we do need to have a welcoming, loving congregation. If you're new to our church, you need to know before COVID, we'd hug your neck. We'd, we'd shake your hand and, and all those things. Now we just do this behind the mask. I hate it and I pray it goes away real soon. I want us to have a welcoming, loving church. But the Great Commission didn't just say welcome those that come to you. He said go to them. Here's the fact of the matter. Every day in Horry County, more than 40 people move to this area, to this county. Over 40 people move to Horry County every day. You don't believe me? Just ride around and look at all the housing developments being, being built, right? And uh, there, people are coming here in, in droves. And you look around today and you go, well, where are all those people in church today? Do you know that within two or three miles of where I'm standing today, Statistics tell us there's over 30,000 lost people. Not people, lost people. And here's what Jesus' plan is for reaching those people, you and me, in our church. He says we need to go to them. Now watch, who is Jesus giving this great commission to? And you say, preacher, I know exactly who he's giving this to. It's the deacons. Amen. The deacons need to go. Reach these people. Why are they here if they're not going? No, preacher, i tell you who it is. It's the people in full-time ministry. He's talking to you, preacher, and he's talking to the other pastors, and he's talking, well, I just lost a button, and he's talking to the full-time missionaries. They need to go. Here's another reality for us to come to grips with and to understand. 
If you claim to be a child of God, then you're a disciple. And Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says to his disciples, go, therefore. And you say, well, I agree with you, pastor. He's talking to the disciples, but he's talking to the disciples. He's not talking to me, disciples. He's talking to the disciples. Do you really think that God's plan to reach the world for all times was just for these 11 guys that have been dead for 2,000 years? Probably not. And you know what it means to be a disciple? I know you do because I've been preaching this for six years. It means to be a follower. It means to be a follower. So if you claim to be a follower of Christ, we need to take seriously the Great Commission. It is impossible to follow Jesus and not be burdened for and involved in the Great Commission. And part of that Great Commission is seeking the lost and sharing the gospel. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 4, 19, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He didn't say, follow me and I'll make you a productive church member. I'll make you a faithful tither. No, he says, here's a characteristic that will be real and true in every real and true follower of mine. If you follow me, You'll be serious about seeing lost people come to know me as their Lord and Savior. If you follow me, I will make you a fisher of men. I heard one church that adopted this slogan, and I, I think they'd be okay with us adopting it as well. They said, found people, find people. If you realize today that God used somebody to bring you into a saving relationship with him, that should burden and motivate you to do the same thing for someone else. And Jesus himself said, I have come to seek and to save the lost. And if we're going to follow him, we are going to seek to save the lost. That's a part of this great commission. It's what he's called us to go and do. So tell yourself right now, say, Jesus is talking to who? He's talking to me. He's talking to you. All right, question number two is where are we supposed to go? We know who he's talking to. Where are we supposed to go? Now flip over to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Here's what Jesus said again, red letters. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And I'll get to that in a minute. And you shall be witnesses to me. In Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. All right, so here's where we're supposed to go. When service is over, we'll go to the airport and we'll fly over to Jerusalem to be witnesses for Christ. Right? That's what we have to do. He said we need to go to Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea and, and all that, that stuff. No, he's talking to those people. Here's what he's saying. You need to go to three places. Number one, you need to go into your community. When he said you need to go to Jerusalem, that's where they were. He said, you need to go close by. Jamestown Baptist Church was planted in Conway, South Carolina for this purpose. To reach Conway, South Carolina for Christ. It's what we're here to do. We, we should be a, a lighthouse in this community. Not a trophy case of our goodness but a lighthouse to our community that sends the good news of the gospel to every man, woman, boy, and girl. There are physical needs that need to be met in this community. There are social needs that meet, need to be met in this community, and we play a part in that. I believe that's a part of mission sometimes. But nothing takes precedence over the fact that God has called us to share his glorious gospel with lost people. We need to go into Conway. We need to go to Horry County. We need to go to UCLA. If you're new here, that's Upper Conway, Lower Ainer. We need to go everywhere we can locally with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that's not it. He says you need to go in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. Not only do we go to our community, but we go to our country. We're to work together with other Christians. To saturate the United States of America with the gospel. 
North America, Canada, we are to be witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ in Conway and in the United States. You say, well, how can we do that? Well, really, we partner with other people, right? We have the North American Mission Board and the Southern Baptist Convention. That's a great way to do it. We partner with missionaries. We, we fund mission efforts. Sometimes we get on a bus or an airplane and we go outside of Horry County to work with missionaries and church plants in the hopes that we can help them reach people in their community. It's what he's called us to do. God didn't just call us to save people just like us. We're to be burdened for Conway, but not just Conway. We need to be burdened for the state of South Carolina. We need to be burdened for the Southeast. We need to be burdened for the whole United States of America. We need to be burdened for, for Maine and um, Arizona and, and Washington and, and Florida and all points in between. We need to be burdened that those people... Just like our people come to know Jesus Christ, not only that, our community and our country, but the continents. Did you catch what Jesus said at the end? And to the end of the earth. In other words, Jesus is saying, I want this gospel of mine to go everywhere. Do you know we still have so many people groups in this, in this world that have never heard the name Jesus? They've never heard his name. There are people who have yet to hold a copy of God's word in their hand in their language. As Southern Baptists, we partner with the International Mission Board. And we support missionaries. Gideon's International, we support them. They, they put copies of the word of God all over the globe. And we're grateful for these people. We, we pray for them. And sometimes we leave our country. Jamestown in the past has been to Belize. We've been to Canada. And there's a lot of places we can go. But sometimes we don't go physically, but we go spiritually and we go financially and we partner with people on the ground already there. It's what God has called us to do. And you say, Pastor, that is such a big task. It was a big task, Pastor, when you said there's 30 to 40,000 within three or four miles of our church. Now you've included the world, the globe, six billion people. It's a big task, but we serve a big God. Did you hear what Jesus said in Acts 1.8? He says, but you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that works in us and through us to reach the world with the gospel. Anytime God calls us to a task, he equips us to do it. And he's given us this Holy Spirit to work in us. Do you know when you share the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit's working? When you share the word of God, the Holy Spirit's working. I don't have any confidence today in my ability to preach or my, my talent or, or education or anything. Here's what I have faith in. The power of the Holy Spirit to take his word and implant it in your heart and bear fruit. I've seen him do it with some of the sorriest sermons I've ever heard. My own. And I've preached some sermons I thought should, should go to the Sermon Hall of Fame. And God not do anything. And I've preached sometimes and thought, what a big old mess that was. And four or five people get saved at the end. You know why? Because it's not about me. It's the help of the Holy Spirit. You say, preacher, I can't be a witness. I can't be a fisher. Man, I've never been to seminary. I hadn't even been saved long. Well, man, you can be like the woman at the well. She got saved and went back to town. And several people came to know Christ. You say, I don't know, know much about the Bible, but you know what he's done in your own heart. And you share that with other people. But here's really what I want you to see. I don't know if I've ever really made this, driven this, this point home. But God has also established the church to accomplish the Great Commission. Ed Stetzer said it this way, and I've never, I've never said it this way. He said, more than the church has a mission, the mission has a church. If, if, if you're like me, you need to hear that again. He said, more than the church has a mission, the mission has a church. And here's the truth I want you to see today before we move down there. Sometimes we think God gave us the church and a part of being the church is this mission. We need to think about it this way. Christ has given us this mission. And to help fulfill it, he's given us the church. Have you ever thought about it that way? 
that the reason God established his church wasn't just so we could come together on Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock sharp and stop 12 o'clock dull, sing a couple of songs, listen to a sermon, throw some money in a plate and go home. Friend, we're here for more than that. He established the church to fulfill the mission. So listen, if we're not about the mission, we may as well sit right here where we are and put that other building up for sale. In fact, if we're not about the mission, we're really just going through the motions here, guys. I love coming to church. I like the songs we sing. I like seeing you and fellowshipping and having a good time. But we're not here just for that. We're here to motivate one another and to equip one another to accomplish the mission. This great commission isn't a lone wolf thing that he sent just me out. He sent us out to do it. All right. Are you still with me? All right. Are we, are, are we still in agreement so far? All right. So number two, I want you to see this. What, well, what is this great commission? We know who gave it to us, and we know who he was talking to, and we know where we're supposed to go. But when we get there, what are we doing? What is the purpose of the Great Commission? Well, it's twofold, really. Number one is to do the work of evangelism. To do the work of evangelism. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So he has called us to make disciples. What does it mean to make a disciple? Well, the first thing we've got to do is see them come to know Christ. This gives us a clue as to what it means because Jesus says, after you do that, baptize them. Well, when do you get baptized? You get baptized after salvation. So here's the first part of the Great Commission. Go to lost people, preach and teach the gospel, share the gospel, and see men, women, boys, and girls come to know Christ. That's a big part of it, to do the work of evangelism. Let me tell you something. I love the work of evangelism. And as a pastor, it's one of the easiest things to do. You know why? Because God does all the work. Because I share the gospel or I preach a message and the Holy Spirit of God quickens the lost person's spirit, opens their blinded eyes, enlightens their mind to the truth that they're sinners in need of a Savior and Jesus died for their sin, was buried and rose again. The Bible says Holy Spirit does all that work. All I'm doing is preaching or sharing the gospel or my, or my testimony. That, that's it. And what happens is a miraculous thing. The Bible says they are quickened. They are raised from death to life. And God does all that. And it happens in an instant. And then the Bible says the first thing that needs to happen after a person is saved is they need to be baptized. And you know, maybe you need to hear that today. Maybe your testimony is like mine. You know mine if you've been here long enough. Six years old, I came down front. I prayed a prayer. They put me in line for baptism. Two weeks later on a Sunday night, I got baptized with a couple of my buddies. And I was saved. I, I was a church member. I went to Christian school. I learned scripture. I learned how to pray. Then I, I learned I could carry a tune a little bit. So they put me up on the pulpit and I was singing. And people thought, oh man, he's really saved because he can sing and his haircut looks like Jimmy Swaggart and all these wonderful things. These were traits and characteristics of biblical discipleship. <laughs> I'm being facetious, right? 14 years old, I wore a suit to church. I was independent Baptist. That's what saved people did, right? I didn't just have a Bible. I had a KJV 1611. My Bible was better than you. My haircut was better than you. My suit was better than you. I could pray deacons under the table. But I didn't know Jesus. Till I was 17 years old. And I wondered why every time the pastor gave an invitation, my palms got sweaty and my heart beat fast. And I realized I had a head knowledge of Jesus through Christian school and going to church. But I had not truly personally received Christ. So I did that. Finally, I just went here. Here's my, my prayer that day. I said, God, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm just tired of worrying about this. I want to make sure that I'm saved today. And he did that. <clears throat> and here's what I told myself. Well, I don't need to get baptized because I've already been baptized. I got baptized when I was six years old. So I tried to retroactively apply my baptism as a six-year-old to my salvation at 17. And that worked for six years. And then I heard a preacher named Herb Revis preach a sermon. 
called The Power of Priorities. And in that sermon, he said these words, the first act of obedience after you come to Christ is to be baptized. And the Holy Spirit said, that's you, buddy. And I told God, I said, but God, I'm on staff at a church. It's going to look weird. The minister of music gets baptized. And God says, I'm cool with weird. I saved you, didn't I? <laughs> Long story short, uh, one Sunday at Waycross Baptist in Pelzer, the minister of music and students got baptized because six years earlier he got saved. And God's used that testimony to lead other people to Christ and, and to be, be baptized. Here's what you need to do. If, you, if you've been saved and you haven't been baptized, you need to make a priority to get that done. Now, does that make you more saved? No. Does it make you more obedient? Yes. And God uses that as a public profession of what God has done in your heart. And it gives testimony to salvation. We are to do that. That's a part of the Great Commission. You know why we have a big old tub we're going to fill up to baptize people? Because it's not just because we're Baptists. We're, we baptize because Jesus said that's what we're supposed to do. It's what we're supposed to do. We could have saved a lot of money buying a lot of Dixie cups and just, you know, throwing it on people's heads. I'm sure that was discussed at some point in time. We could even get the Walmart cups, save money, not even get the Dixie cups, right? But the word baptismo in the Greek means to immerse. That's why we put people under the water, and it gives testimony. It's part of the Great Commission. So that's the first part. But watch, that's not all we do. He says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Watch verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the, of the age. Now, Jesus is talking about the process of discipleship. Salvation happens in a moment. Baptism happens one day. But discipleship lasts a lifetime. I ask our 9 o'clock service this. Uh, have you ever been to one of our discipleship graduation services? Anybody? You ever been there? I see you're, you're kind of panicked. You're going, oh, they must do that on Wednesday night. No, if we did have discipleship graduation services, it probably would be on, uh, on Wednesday night. But we don't have discipleship graduation services here. You know why? Because you never graduate from the school of discipleship. It is a lifelong pursuit. You don't move your tassel from one side to the other and get your degree in discipleship until you get to glory. We're all involved in the process of discipleship. And discipleship involves a couple of things. First of all, it involves a direction. It's a process. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Making something takes time. Becoming a disciple and a true follower of Jesus Christ, it's, it's a process. Now, I've been saved since I was 17. I'm more like Jesus at 46 than I was at 20, but I'm still not there yet. And just because I'm 46 doesn't give you an indication of where I am in my discipleship process because I've met some 70-year-old Christians that act like 5-year-old Christians. And I've met some 25-year-old Christians that acted like 85-year-old Christians because they were more mature in the faith. It's not a physical maturation process. It's a spiritual maturation process. And it's, it's, not, it's not one that's, that's glamorous. It's not one that's, that's exciting. Jesus used the word teaching. Teaching. Nobody likes to be taught. That's boring. Preach to me. Sing to me. And then send me home. But this is, this is a process. And this is why discipleship struggles in a lot of churches. In fact, most churches. Because it takes effort. Let me ask you a question. What's the longest you've ever waited for a table at a restaurant? Anybody? What's the, some insane time you've waited? Two hours. All right? Two hours to, to eat, eat a meal. Was it good? Was it, was it worth it? Eh, see there, after two hours, you'd like for it to be... Well, let me ask you this. You don't have to say it out, out loud. Um, what's the most you ever paid for an event ticket? What's the longest drive you've ever taken for a sporting event or a vacation? A couple of years ago, we 
had season tickets. Never done that before. It was the boys' Christmas present. We got them season tickets to the uh, Gamecocks, and we'd get up on Saturday morning. Actually, it'd start on Friday night. We'd buy drinks, and then we'd pack the cooler. Then we'd get up early, and we'd all put on our garnet stuff, and, and then we'd get in the car, and we'd fill up the tank, and we'd drive two hours. We'd sit in traffic another two hours. Then we'd get to the tailgate spot, and we'd put up the tent and get out the fried chicken, and we'd swallow that. We'd get heartburn. We'd put it all back up so we could shuttle into the stadium like cattle. And then we would get inside and we'd sit in our seat, which was really like half a seat. And you're surrounded by 82,000 of your closest friends and they're drinking and spitting and cussing and sweating all over you. And you sit through that game. It may rain. If it's not raining, it's probably going to be hot and sweaty and humid. And you pray that it goes into overtime. And then you go back out to your car and you pack all that stuff back, back up into your vehicle so you can get in line for more traffic, drive two hours home. By the time you're home, you're exhausted and you're broke. And you know what you say? Can't wait till next week. <sighs> Can't wait. Can't wait. Man, you walk into a church or you pull in, you can't find your parking place. You can't sit in your pew. You say, I'm going home. This is ridiculous. I like my optimum worship temperature is 71 degrees. Today it was 72. It is ridiculous. I didn't know that new song Matt sung. He needs to be fired. Let's go back to I'll Fly Away, Victory in Jesus. And uh, I want this. I want the preacher to use this Bible. I want him to dress this way. I want to be out at 12 o'clock. Uh, sound familiar? See, see, becoming like Christ takes effort and it takes time. Somebody said they've waited two hours to eat at a restaurant. Let me ask you this question. Do you ever stand in line at the gym to get on the treadmill? I've never seen a line at the treadmill. <laughs> I go to Planet Fitness. I've never had to wait in line to get on the elliptical. But man, when I go to Outback, I have to call ahead. And there's a lot more restaurants than there are gyms. Here's the point I'm trying to make. Food feeds the flesh. But exercise builds the body. What's more fun? Feeding the flesh. You know why discipleship is hard? It's because it takes effort. It's, it's getting on the, on the treadmill. We may pack it out on Sunday morning or revival or if we have the kingdom, uh, the kingsman here. But now Wednesday night, there'll be a lot of seating. When we have a witness training, you can spread out. You can social distance at that. Sunday school traditionally runs at about half of what worship attendance runs because it's harder. It takes more effort, but it's what he's called us to do. So this great commission involves more than just being saved. It means growing in your relationship with God. Are y'all still with me? We're almost done. What does this all mean for us? Why did I pray and ask God to, uh, to give me something on, on the Great Commission. What does this mean for us as we move here? What do I mean by recalibrating? Here's what I mean. Even when a church means well, sometimes the things we do become more important than the reason we're doing them. One of the four things we need to be built on that's woven into the fabric and DNA of everything we do is the Great Commission. The other things we're going to be looking at are love for one another. We're going to be looking at the Word of God, and we're going to be looking at worship. Everything else we do as a church stands on those four pillars. And if what we're doing doesn't fit under one of those four pillars, then we don't need to be doing those things. It's not what God's called us to do. So what it means then to be a great commission church, it means we'll not become the Jamestown Country Club. A place for recreation with like-minded people that look like us of the same tax bracket. It won't simply become the Jamestown Social Club where we have different groups seeking to advance their cause or their preferences. We're the Jamestown Southern Gospelers. Or the Jamestown Contemporary Worshippers. Or the ones advocating for social changers. It also means we'll not become the Jamestown political headquarters for the Republicans or the Democrats. So help me God, as long as I have anything to do with it, we'll never have a candidate for office stand behind the pulpit of our church. 
Is it because they're sinners? No. But the minute you put a candidate behind the pulpit and they have an R behind their name or a D behind their name, you alienate and turn off every other lost person of the other political party. And God hadn't called me to fill the Senate with Republicans or the Congress with Democrats. He's called me to reach men, women, boys, and girls with the gospel. I have voting preferences. If you want to talk about it, we can do that outside of this church. But here, it's gospel above all gospel above all it means we'll not become the jamestown concert hall where we gather to sing our songs in our styles or to have big concerts with big groups even though i love it what it means is this great commission will guide determine motivate and permeate everything we do why do we do sunday school so we can help each other grow in the knowledge of the word Why do we have children and youth programs, not just for babysitting, even though that's great. It's to train up our children in the way they should go. Why do we have witness trainings so people can learn to share their faith? We need to be about the Great Commission. And one of the things that will tell us whether or not we are a Great Commission church will be our church budget. If it's serious to us, if it's a priority, it will show up there. It will show up in our budget. It will show up in our uh, programs. It will show up in our preaching and in our singing that we are about the Great Commission. But not only does it mean something for us as a church, it means something to us as people. What does this mean to you? You see, the Great Commission is both a corporate and a personal call. You say, what do you mean by corporate? I mean, it's something our church should strive together to fulfill. But it's also something I should be striving to fulfill. I want to ask you a question. I asked myself this question in putting this this together. Where are you as a disciple? I preached a whole series on this a little over a year ago. You can probably find the messages on on YouTube, it's, it's not because they're great messages, but it's just a great message from God's word. It's, it's what he's called us to do. We need to identify where we are on our journey as believers. Are you a Christian infant? Maybe you're a new believer. Or maybe you got saved a few years ago, but you hadn't started reading your Bible or praying or doing anything like that. You're probably a Christian infant. You can't feed yourself yet. You, every, everything you're getting right now, you're getting from me or somebody on the radio or maybe a family member. But maybe you got saved and you got baptized and you joined a Sunday school class and now you're beginning to grow in the word. Now you're a, now you're a Christian adolescent. You're, you're a Christian child. But just like is the case with physical children, spiritual children can be very selfish. We like church. And we come to church and we like our Sunday school class, but it's our Sunday school class and it's our teacher. And we like things our way. And when a child don't get his way, what happens? Everybody in Walmart knows it. And everybody in the church knows it when the Christian child in the church doesn't get their way either because they cry about it and they fuss about it. And then as you grow up a little bit more, uh, then you become a, a Christian adult. Now is when you start not just sitting in class, you begin teaching a class. You don't just vote to put people on committees. You're on the committees. You're using your God-given talent to further the kingdom of God. Now you're learning to feed yourself. And you know what? For years, I thought this was it. I thought that was the apex. But here's the The next rung up on the ladder is you become a Christian parent. What does that mean? It means now you're producing other Christians. Now you're sharing your faith. Now you are helping somebody else grow in their faith. Now you're a Sunday school teacher and you say, you know what? Tomorrow I'm going to go visit so-and-so. They're sick. They're in the hospital whenever we're allowed to do that again. But instead of going by myself, I'm going to take Matt with me because Matt's kind of new at this and he's never done it before, but I can tell he's trying to grow in the Lord. So I'm going to take him so he can watch me. I want to go knock on some doors. 
But I want to take Brad with me because I think Brad would be a good witness for Jesus Christ. And uh, I want him to see how I do it, and maybe that will help him become a better witness. Hey, that, that, that person I buy my coffee from or where I get my haircut, clearly I'm talking coffee for me, haircut for you. I'm not sure they know Jesus, so I want to invite them to our church, or I'm going to ask them if I can share my testimony. You see how as, as you grow up, how you respond to others changes. Where are you as a disciple? And listen, if you're not where you should be, I'm not here to beat you over the head with this Bible. I just want to challenge you to take the next step. Take the next step. What are you doing to make disciples? Where are you in your discipleship journey? Uh, because I, I hope you'll serve with me through this church. But ultimately, this is a personal decision between you and God.